Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's UTP Talks webinar. Um, so yeah, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, we have a lot of people registered from all over Canada and various parts of the world, so welcome to everyone. Um, today, we will be celebrating the brand new book launch for Nuances of Blackness in the Canadian Academy, Teaching, Learning, and Researching While Black. So please feel free to say hi in the chat box and also send us any um, audience questions in the Q&A and the panel will um, try to answer as many as possible during the webinar. Um, so yes, um, my name is Brianna Muir and I'm a marketing manager at the University of Toronto Press. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and before I hand things over to our moderator, Shirley Ann Tate, to kick things off, I would like to first acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto Press operates. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So first, I would like to thank Shirley Ann Tate for moderating this launch. Um, so Shirley Ann uh, Tate is a professor and Canada Research Chair, Tier 1 in Fe Feminism and Intersectionality in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. So I'd like to hand things over to Shirley Ann Tate and um, to introduce today's panel. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Brianna. Um, I am here in Treaty 6 territory, um, and I know we're, we're in very many different territories right across Canada. I would like to begin by just doing very brief introductions to the panelists, and then um, they will afterwards speak about different sections of their edited collection. So let me start with Handel. Handel Wright is the inaugural senior advisor to the president on anti-racism and inclusive excellence, professor of educational studies and director of the Center for Culture, Identity and Education at the University of British Columbia. He has published extensively on continental and diasporic African cultural studies, qualitative research, cultural studies of education and critical multiculturalism and its alternatives. Tamari Kitosa is Associate Professor of Sociology at Brock University, and he, he has been an Associate Professor since 2006. His research and instructional interests include Blackness and anti-Blackness, Black masculinities, African-Canadian leadership, anti-criminology and counter-colonial criminology, and interracial unions. Melinda Smith is the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Research for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and a full Professor of Political Science at the University of Calgary. Her research focuses on Black Canadian trailblazers in politics, law, education and STEM, EDID in higher education, and international and comparative politics. Lastly, Awad Ibrahim, is a curriculum theory professor in the Faculty of Education, University of Ottawa. Among his areas of interest are black youth studies, hip hop, black thought in education, applied linguistics and critical ethnography. I'm going to pass over now to Handel to begin the section introductions. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Tate for the introduction. Um, greetings from my home, everyone, uh, in Richmond, British Columbia. I want to acknowledge that the place now called Richmond is part of the traditional and unceded land of some of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Kwantlen, the Tuasan, and the Mosqueum. A basic premise of this collection of essays is that the university in Canada was built on and for and remains the Eurocentric world of middle-class male whiteness. The very existence and indeed proliferation of positions and offices of indigeneity, anti-racism, equity and diversity are progressive steps that nonetheless prove the perennial nature of the problem of exclusion of indigenous and racialized peoples and other ways of knowing well into the 21st century. 
This text is comprised of four sections, and I will speak to the first section, which is titled Blackness, What's in a Name? In his commentary on the section, George Sefer Day draws on Fanon and Du Bois to signal our text's approach of complexity and unity without resort to prescription. As he puts it, Blackness is too rich to be contained by a singular narrative and to be written about and from a single playbook, end quote. So who is the Black academic and how are we positioned in the Canadian Academy? How do we conceptualize ourselves and Blackness into existence? In my own cultural studies contribution titled The Awkward Presence of Blackness in the Canadian Academy, I assert the corollary premise to the whiteness of the university, namely that blackness is rendered an awkward presence. The black body, a body out of place on campus. The black academic, the unexpected professor, out of place in front of the class. Black academic is, necess is a necessarily political articulation that stretches beyond gender and sexuality binaries and includes continental African Canadians and Caribbean double diasporic subjects, immigrants from the US and blacks whose presence stretch back to enslavement and the so-called settlement of Canada. Our contribution to inclusive excellence, I conclude, should involve collaboration with progressive others, indigenous, racialized and white. The section next moves to the specificity of black feminist examination of the compounded racism and sexism that female academics face. In her essay, Exposed, the Ivory Towers Code Noir, Delia um, Douglas speaks to the disregard and marginalization black women face in the academy, not just anti-black racism and not just sexism against black women, but the imbrication of these into what is now being called misogynoir, or as Douglas prefers, anti-Black gendered racism. Black women constitute 0.7% of the professoriate in Canada, a gross underrepresentation, which is perversely taken up as proof of the inferiority and unsuitability of Blacks in general and Black women in particular. This double discrimination, she asserts, is integral to, bolst to bolstering what she identified as, quote, contemporary settler colonial enslaved interpersonal relations and intellectual hierarchies. In his philosophical contribution titled The Precariat African Canadian Academic, Ali Abdi speaks to the ways in which the supposedly universal and open Canadian Academy has what he calls the persona Africana locked in a perpetual struggle for full inclusion and recognition. As Gayatri Spivak would put it, we are the not quite not citizen. In an approach reminiscent of Stuart Hall's utilization of Antonio Gramsci to speak to black identity, Awad Ibrahim utilizes Deleuze and Batari to articulate black identity. In his con contribution titled, What Have Deleuze and Batari Got to Do with Blackness? He offers a rhizomatic definition and analysis of blackness. Importantly, he eschews the colonial frame in order to consider blackness as a multilingual, multi-ethnic and multicultural category. The glimpse in this first section of the rich diversity and identities and identifications that make up Black Canadian identity and the complexity of the variety of theoretical approaches we utilize might be somewhat bewildering. And in the end, and we end this section with a contribution by Gina Tessie, who reminds us that understanding Black Canadian identity, including Black Canadian academic identity, it's not a matter of getting one's head around this complexity and diversity. Tessie writes about the fact that in the confluence of the French language and Quebecois interculturalism, there is a repression of race and raciology such that it is in fact virtually impossible to speak black identity into existence, to be heard and seen 
as a Black Quebecois subject. Hence the title of her essay, Dancing with Invisibility slash Inaudibility, Nuances of Blackness in the Francophone Context. So section one therefore starts us off with the nuances and complexities of Black identity and of interpolation into Blackness and into the academy. It sets the tone by offering the Black academic as diverse in its articulation with pride and with the caveat of Stuart Hall's now famous Gramscian derived notion. In short, what we offer you is blackness without guarantees. I'll pass things on now to my colleague and co-editor, Tamari Kitosa. Thank you. Thank you, Handel. Before I provide a brief summary of the uh, commentary and the chapters for section two, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which Brock University sits is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. I would hasten to add that on those lands, not only were uh, African people uh, self-emancipated, but they were also enslaved. So part two of Nuances of Blackness in the Canadian Academy is titled Blackness and Academic Pathways. The section is led off by Dr. Wisdom Tetti's analytical commentary and discussion of the key themes and issues explored in the five chapters in the section. Dr. Tetti's contribution is fittingly titled Blackness in the Canadian Academy, Challenges, Contestations and Contradictions. His commentary not only recapitulates the core themes of these chapters, he draws on them to meditate on how a genuine commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion can be more than a rhetorical strategy for blackwashing the university. At the same time, he draws on the candid and sophisticated ways that each chapter tells stories of the complex social location of black academics, evidenced by the expectations and pressures of institutional responsibilities and communal demands, which often pull in opposing directions. Crucially, in addition to offering concrete strategies for how to seriously center Blackness at the heart of EDI, Dr. Tetti's commentary encourages us to squarely face and transcend the dangers and missteps of Black essentialism, Black complicity with institutional complacency, and careerist self-aggrandizing allyship. Now, I can hardly do justice to the five chapters of this section any more than I did justice to Dr. Tetti's commentary, but with the limited time at my disposal, I will nevertheless briefly gesture to the principal arguments and themes of each of the contributors' essays. In chapter six of Dr. Melinda Smith's essay, Hidden Figures, Black Scholars in the Early Canadian Academy, we are presented with a play on the term, quote, hidden figures, end quote, in ways that challenge, resist, and rupture the single story of blackness as deficit or black as lack. This is, the, this is, um, this is first in the ontological sense of, uh, it is an ep epistemic archeology span that recovers a dozen erased black scholastic trailblazers in pre and post confederation Canada. Um, the essay also uh, challenges and exposes the issue of hidden figures when Dr. Smith recovers not only the numerical firsts, but she also points out that these are also figures who made significant contributions to knowledge, public service, and provided philanthropic support to major Canadian universities. In addition, the second aspect of the hidden figures is a cheeky commentary that, all, that although black voices in, in academia are under, underrepresented and just representation is a must, the black presence in academia highlights the multiplicity and the complexity of black lives. In chapter seven, titled Committed to Employment Equity, with a question mark, Impediments to Obtaining University Appointments, Dr. Carl James posits an, 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 posits an impolitic critique of the pro forma equity statements that appear almost as an afterthought on professorial job ads. The essential question 
given the lack of success to increase the numbers of, black, of the Black professoriate the past 20 years, is whether pro forma equity statements are, quote, trying to convince the skeptical reader and potential applicants that the university is truly committed to equitable access and is really a welcoming environment. Dr. James posits that the paucity in hiring black faculty members is driven by the means of neoliberalist discourses of responsabilization and its promotion of competitiveness normed on the ontology and proximity to whiteness. He also crit critiques the role of the myth of colorblindness as this is articulated through neoliberalism. Crucial to Dr. James's analysis is his examination of the ways that the term visible minority conceals the exclusion of the, block, of the black professoriate within this overly inclusive employment equity category. In chapter eight, written by Dr. Wesley Crutchlow, Crutchlow sorry, titled Black Gay Scholar and the Provocation of Promotion. At the heart of this contribution is the recognition that for young black LGBTQS plus scholars, mentors and mentoring are at a premium. The reasons are twofold. First, the paucity of black faculty members, and second, an even smaller number of black faculty members who are LGBTQS plus. Dr. Critchell stories his journey toward full, toward full professorship as a black gay scholar. I will draw on Dr. Crystal's words to sum up the contribution of this chapter. He writes, since most codes and cues for surviving and thriving in academia are heel to toe and uttered in whispers, the arduous apprenticeship for becoming a scholar involves exceptional open secrecy. Despite the formal presentation of collegiality, openness and academic freedom, with so few black LGBTQS plus scholars to mentor young black LGBTQS scholars, there is a world of subtlety in academia, not least for PhDs in knowing how to navigate postdocs, job applications, course evaluations, peer interactions, and ways to build the documentary evidence for promotion. In chapter nine, titled Certainty, Certain Uncertainty, Phenomenology of an African Canadian Professor, is written by myself. The chapter argues that it is necessary to resist polarizing constructions of the university and the community as though both sites of social interaction are coherent and homogeneous. Instead, I posit that in the phenomenology of the black professor, both quote, town and gown are in dialogue and that the dialogue is not always harmonious. The contention of the chapter is that when priority rests with principles and values that are clearly articulated, blackness becomes an expression of the human condition toward which the arc of justice is pursued. And finally, chapter 10, written by Drs. K. Ann Williams and Dr. Gervin Fearon, is titled Sociocultural Obligations and the Academic Career, The Dual Expectations Facing Black Canadian Academics. This chapter examines the contradictions, prospects, and realities of expectations fulfilled by Black academics in the context of often opposing demands placed on them by their work in the academy and the expectations of Black communities of which they are a part. Drawing on their own experience navigating both social spaces, Williams and Fearon conclude optimistically noting that the building of human capital and drawing on the different components of the community capital can assist in overcoming challenges precipitated by a frayed careers trajectory and social economic disp disparities where race is a significant determinant. I would now turn the floor over to my, uh, my co-editor, uh, Dr. Melinda Smith. Thank you, Dr. Katoso. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the University of Calgary, and that which is on the on Treaty Seven territories in southern Alberta, and that uh, the city of Calgary is also homeland to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region Three. I will be speaking to you about the chapters in Part Three, which is entitled "Blackness: A Complicated Canadian Conversation." This section begins with a commentary from. Uh, this section begins with a commentary from Dr. Annette Henry, 
who is the David Lamb uh, Chair in Multicultural Education at the University of British Columbia. In that commentary, she identifies questions of what it means to be Black and to belong in and to Canada and the Academy. And also to, to talk about the ways in which questions often posed to Black scholars are not innocent. But, right, but actually serve to function to produce Black scholars as outsiders as, um, and to highlight the, uh, or, um, what she calls the blunt, curt, clipped exchanges, slips of the tongue, imposing and impolite inferences, presuppositions, and interrogation that corrode the heart and challenge the presence and integrity of the Black Canadian body and intellect in public and intellectual spaces. The five chapters that she highlights in the set that are in that section are by scholars from Simon Fraser University, Queen's University, the University of Ottawa, and now um, the University of Stavanger in Norway. Again, highlighting the extent to which the chapters and nuances of blackness are written by scholars from across the Canadian Academy and at different levels. So the chapter 11 is by Henry Daniel from SFU and it's entitled Fitting, Fitting, Fitting In and Fitting Out, in which uh, Daniel reminds us of the importance of the black body and the performative, including black body and the performance of blackness and offers a rather uh, a, a stunning uh, meditation on the intersections of the poetic and the political in the encounter of blacks within the academy. The chapter 12 is, by, uh, is written by Emmanuel Tabby and it's entitled, the, the Caged Bird Still Sings in Harmony, the Academy Spoken Word Poetry and the Making of the Black Community. Uh, Emmanuel Kad, uh, Tabby tells the story of why we need to localize our knowledges and our scholarship while always struggling to speak the academic language here, the academy, a place of, pre, uh, of preeminently of the written word in meeting the community of spoken word, mutually implicating sites of challenge, resistance, solidarities on the margin. Fellow poet and creative writer, Julianne okot Batek in chapter 13 highlights states of being, the poetic and scholarship, as a Black African and diasporic woman, highlighting the multiplicity and the diversity of Blackness across the Canadian, in the Canadian society and across the academy. Like Daniel and Tabby before her, she uses the performative, in this case, poetry, to situate and locate her self understanding at the intersections of gender, Blackness, Africanness in the diaspora. In chapter 14, Delise Mugabo asks, who is at the University of Ottawa in Feminist Studies asks the question and explores the discussion around intersectionality in which she terms intersectionality in black face. When post-racial nationalism meets black feminism, highlighting the experiences of being black and feminist in, in Francophone Canada, specifically in Quebec universities. And, and the very discussion about who owns black studies and black feminism Above all, who benefits from these studies being situated in the academy? If blackness does not exist in French, Quebec included, then who's those who introduce intersectional studies where intersection is a concept that first introduces, was first introduced by black feminism. If we don't benefit the most, to be sure, Mukabo contends, White Francophone nationalist feminists benefit the most from Black feminism and its intersectional studies in the Canadian University. And in fact, intersectionality is often deployed to, to, to buttress white feminism, often leaving Black women on the margins. In chapter 15, respatializing the boundaries of belonging to subversive Blackness of Muslim women, Jan Therese Mendez examines how feminists how Muslim women's claim to black selfhood makes them walk through, so to speak, an African diasporic membership in which feeling one's Africanness is employed as an affective resource to avoid an inter interminable placeness. 
In sum, then, the chapters in this volume and, and in this section, and I think uh, uh, specifically highlighting uh, the, the work of uh, Annette Henry, explore how questions, these what she calls these blunt curt, as I refer to clipped questions, function under the white gaze to suggest the black presence is an anomaly, if not dangerous. They suggest we do not belong, we are out of place, they commodify and dehumanize, set limits on who we are, should be, can be, according to Patek. They also explore the white epistemic view of knowledge, how the world works uh, in the uh, uh, largesse of Eurocentric epistemic projects. The chapters are work of refusal to cite uh, Mohawk scholar um, Roger Simpson. They refuse the way the predominantly white academy tried to circumscribe our lives, possibilities, try to force us to justify our research, our teaching, our presence, even our humanity. They highlight how, although we were never meant to survive, according to Audre Lorde, we engage in self-help and we continue to thrive. Thank you. I'll turn the floor over now to my colleague, uh, um, Awad Ibrahim, who I see has left. Uh, he is... Um, Dr. I think he's, uh, sorry, sorry, Melinda, I think he's lost connection. So I think, Handel, will you uh, say something on that section? Because I also have his, his you yeah. have it. Okay. I have his presentation. We have his statement. Melinda, did you read it or I could read oh. it? Go ahead, Handel, read it. Um, so yeah, uh, Professor Ibrahim apologizes. He's having connection problems um, and so cannot join us. So the following is what he intended to say and I'll just read his comments. Um, uh, Awad Ibrahim points out that the book's overarching question is, what happens when the unexpected shows up? What happens when the unexpected is a black body which finds itself in a nice place like the Canadian Academy? Part four answers this question by drawing on the African indigenous conception of time that imagines coherence and unity in the dialectic of past and future. Shirley and Tate opens this section by drawing on the politics of affect. In her opening essay, she attempts to answer this question. What does it mean to feel the wholeness of one's black humanity against suffering and self-negation, even whilst we as black scholars speak our agency with and through suffering and self-negation. I'm not going to spoil it for you, he says, so I invite you to read her opening remarks for this section. Located at York University, the York Collective pushes York to embody and not just talk about black studies. In her chapter, Dolores Mullings um, shows the impact of microaggression from white students. What happens when students either don't like or do not want their beliefs to be challenged? At the intersection of blackness and feminism, that question becomes ever more urgent and complicated. In her chapter, Omisore Dryden makes the bold argument that university might talk the talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, but EDI hasn't disrupted anti-Black racism. So we need to think harder about why that is still the case. Dryden's argument is supported by Jennifer Kelly's chapter, which builds on Kelly's administrative position. Given that we function in neoliberal institutions like universities, Kelly argues, neoliberalism actually um, embraced the circles around radical love. Adel Blackett's chapter calls for alliance between black scholars. Here, our work is turned into an act of um, radicalness for our black communities. Barrington Walker follows Blackett and engages with Black Lives Matter from a history perspective and as a historian. Black Lives Matter is appreciated and critically engaged with. The final chapter of this section and hence the book is by Melinda Smith, where we have one of the most comprehensive surveys of Canadian higher education 
in order to map black presence and absence in the academy. When it comes to black faculty, students, administrators, and black studies, we have some serious work to do. And we do that, Smith reminds us. As we do that, Smith reminds us, we should resist whiteness and the oppressive homogenizing of anti-blackness and create an enabling space for black multiplicity. Thanks, that's from Professor Ibrahim. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I hope I hope Awad can join us in a bit, but um, you, you've you've produced an amazing book. I hope you know that. <laughs> I hope somebody has said this to you before now too. But you've you've produced an amazing book, and I, I I'm really looking forward to to delving into it in in a lot more detail than I have been able to in the past. Um, I, I want to start with with a question. Um, about black studies in, in your individual parts of Canada. Can you say something about the status of black studies in Canada, in the Canada, in parts of Canada with which you're familiar? You want to go first, Hanzo? Um, sure. Um, <laughs> yes, well, uh, British Columbia is, is, is somewhat unique. Of course, um, the, the black population is, is, is not a big one in Canada but it's this, an especially small one in British Columbia where I think we're still fighting at about 1.7, um, 1.8% um, of, uh, of the population. And very interestingly, even in um, the major city of Vancouver, unlike other major cities around the country, um, there are no black spaces per se. There are no black ethnoburbs um, in BC. It's quite unique. So this is the circumstance under which uh, Black Studies is uh, supposed to operate. Um, so at my own institution, the University of British Columbia, um, we have no, as yet, no organized, fully organized, comprehensive Black Studies. What we do have, and what is not simultaneous, of course, with the study of Blackness, is a small and precarious African studies minor. Still, we've had that for many years and it still exists and it's still very precarious. And furthermore, um, what we have is um, courses uh, in some areas of the university. Uh, I should particularly acknowledge the Faculty of Arts at the University of um, um, British Columbia, um, Vancouver, and the English department in particular. That's where you'll find some courses uh, on Blackness. So there's momentum now to hire more Black faculty, uh, which is different from doing Black studies. Um, there's some momentum, but we're somewhat behind the eight ball. And um, we still, and there's some momentum on trying to begin to build uh, Black studies at UBC, but we have a long way to go. Thanks a lot, Handel. What about you, Melinda? How do you see it? Well, thanks very much. Um, so I'll, I'll just speak um, in Alberta uh, on the prairies, the black population uh, is the fastest growing in Canada and the black population in Calgary is one of the third and in Edmonton, uh, the third and fourth largest in the country, which I think is, uh, is not well known. What I would also say is that um, we have uh, it, one of the oldest populations uh, in, in, of Black uh, people on the prairies is in Alberta. It's with the so-called Black pioneers that produce people like uh, John Ware, Black cowboy, uh, Violet King, the first Black woman lawyer, um, also the first Black woman uh, um, to, to be on the Canadian television, actually in North America, um, who was, who's on the stamp this year. So the, the Black presence in Alberta has been long, it has not been well recognized in the curriculum. So there is movement afoot to have, so we have African studies at the University of Calgary. I know at University of Alberta, for example, uh, there is effort to re um, re uh, resurrect black studies, uh, a CRC, TL1 in black studies, uh, cluster hires for black studies. There are also uh, the creation of black postdocs. I will say most of this work to energize Black studies, African studies, has been ignited by student associations. The Black Arts Students Association, Black Law Students Association, Black Medical Students Associations have pushed Black entrance 
uh, Black recognition. So I don't think we can have any of this conversation around the emergence of uh, a more robust insistence on Black presence and Black uh, scholarship without highlighting the role of students, uh, both past and present in this work. Thanks. Tamari, over to you. Thank you. I, I think I'll concentrate my remarks on specific developments at Brock University, uh, because beginning in 2013, when we had the Black Studies Association conference there, I worked with um, two colleagues in modern languages and literature, uh, Jean Nataki Rutimana and Richard Nde Zigamie, to, to build on the institutional support that we got from um, the higher administration, particularly Dr. Mori Kinutala, to help us uh, support um, uh, Mikhail Jean uh, being the keynote speaker for that conference. And we wrote a study on how we might develop a Africana studies uh, uh, program at the university, but also what, what we might consider in terms of endowing a chair. So um, we did a wide ranging study looking at the, uh, the, the Johnston chair at, um, at Dalhousie and initiatives in uh, Alberta. And what we've done is we've settled on the lowest hanging fruit, which is to develop a minor in Africana studies that is revenue neutral. So we basically panned the whole university in the uh, humanities and social sciences to see what courses existed. And so we've worked with uh, various, uh, the faculties there to establish the, the minor. And so we, we, we launched the minor last uh, academic year. And so now we're beginning the process of figuring out how to more closely engage with uh, the black communities in uh, the Niagara region. Uh, to develop a certificate program, and then how we might uh, scale up that, that uh, minor uh, to something more substantive. Uh, but this is about engaging with the university in terms of uh, budget lines, revenue, so on and so forth. And those are conversations that are, um, that are currently taking place uh, as we look to scale up our uh, minor in Africana studies. Thanks so much. I, I don't think Awad is still able to connect. So I'll, I'll go to some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, the first question, um, how do you imagine uh, Black liberation in the Canadian Academy? Uh, Handel, do you want to go first again? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there's in a way, the, the book answers this in, in various, various ways. Um, I think in my own essay, part of what I stressed was the importance of um, collaboration, um, of working with other progressives um, so that we don't think of this as a completely self-contained and self-isolated project. So the project of black liberation, I think is a, is a complex thing and it's tied to the liberation of others. So um, there's the support of black folks for indigenous struggles. Um, and that, that is and ought to be a mutual thing. Um, um, even with the idea of uh, white allies as allies might be sometimes a problem, a problematic notion. Um, so, the, the complexity of it is, is re in relation to uh, how we might work with others for everybody's liberation, that's one thing. And even within blackness, um, how we might begin to try not to shy away from our differences, which are sometimes mobilized um, in, in certain ways by whoever wants power, as people jostle for power. Um, and the realization that it's the project itself that is important rather than individual ambitions. There's a lot to be done um, to bring black folks together, um, not um, without erasing our diversity and to work with that diversity um, in getting to our, our liberation. And the third thing I would say is the connection between um, those of us in the academy 
uh, and the community out there, including the Black community. Um, the university works in a way that forces us to be away from community. And doing work with community ends up being something that you either don't get rewarded for in the university or you, um, uh, or you actually get we're punished for for undertaking because it takes so much. So I think those are those are some of the things that we need to take into account when we're working on black liberation and taking taking on roles like Melinda has done, for example, or like I have tried to be taking on roles. We can criticize the university from the outside, and there's space for that. But also rolling up your sleeves and saying, "I'm getting in there. I'm getting in the fight." and I'm trying to make the change within the institution as well, um, is the fourth thing that I would point to. Thanks a lot, Handel. Um, do you want to make any other extra comments, colleagues, or Malinda, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, would, I would say the university is not going to be the sources of, of our liberation. Um, it, it, it may be one space where we try to uh, engage in, in, in moving the needle. I said that, but but I would say is that black scholars, and particularly I, look, I I note this in the my chapter on hidden figures in the uh, in the academy, have been since uh, um, uh, the Victorian period working for community uplift, and I would say that's through self help, and it still is I would say largely self help uh, within the academy, and so. Uh, and I have Heinrich uses the language of collaboration. I, I use the language of uplift and self-help uh, as well. And I would say that's in, in concert with uh, uh, allies. And I'm, I'm specifically thinking about people like um, uh, Dr. Kenneth uh, Melville from McGill, for example, or who, who, who was involved in helping to overturn in Montreal or the Montreal Forum, uh, the, 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 the refusal to serve black people beer at the pub, at the tavern in Montreal Forum, a, a case that's, that's worth noting. I would say that the early civil rights cases you see from Nova Scotia to Alberta, uh, again, people, uh, black scholars who are working not just for uplift within the academy, but also for the broader community. And facing, I would say, a lot of, it's a lot of emotional labor, facing deficit thinking, the tyranny mm -hmm. of low expectation at the same time, but still, nonetheless, doing extraordinary things. The final point I would make about this is um, that it was not just for liberation within Canada or, or the territories we now know as Canada, but also for they were actively engaged in the struggle for liberation and for self-determination globally. And I think and even here, you know, the work of Violet King, the first black woman lawyer, she was involved as a student in this work in the 1940s and 50s, often unrecognized. And so I think one of the things that this book does extremely well, I hope others would agree, is that it maps and charts this work in multiple ways. And as Handel highlights, often unrecognized, but part of our task then is to make it visible and to say how it contributes. But it's an ongoing struggle and we need certainly allies to do it. But I think the heavy lifting is, continues to be self-help. Thanks, Melinda. Tamari, do you want to add anything or shall I ask you another question? Sure, I'll make just a brief contribution. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important uh, question that is being asked. And I think what mm -hmm. the book does is that it demonstrates that black liberation is not an end, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And that involves doing a lot of difficult work, having difficult conversations at times, mm -hmm. uh, because there is the assumption that there is an ideal way of being Black to achieving Black liberation. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of the chapters and the commentaries demonstrate that, uh, that when we come back to Handel's point of all of our various differences, that there are productive ways that if we focus on principles and values, that the Black radical tradition then be, becomes an opportunity to struggle from the vantage point of Blackness for the human condition. And that, for me, is one of the strengths of the book in terms of how it addresses uh, that important question of how do we go about addressing Black liberation. 
Thanks very much, Tamara. Thanks, colleagues. Um, another question from the audience, and this one is about uh, hidden black labor. Uh, the question is, there is hidden and unrecognized emotional labor that black faculty do because of white fragility, the white fragility of colleagues and administrators. And they just merely want you to comment on that. Yeah, well, I, I think we're all smiling in concert <laughs> like that assertion was made. And um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it to maybe to Melinda and Tamari to, to speak to faculty because what the question raises for me is about the fact that this is not just about faculty, this is also about students. Students do a lot of emotional work with other students. Mm -hmm. Concluding at, at UBC, um, uh, a task force on anti-racism and inclusive excellence. And one of the things that came out of, that's coming out of that task force, I'm releasing, I'm co-chair of the task force, is, the, is what some black students asserted about the kind of work that they do. If black faculty feel that the emotional labor that they do is unrecognized, it is 10 times as problematic for black students. Black students have to mentor other black students. Black students have to talk to other black students about what it means to be black at the institution, uh, what faculty to take courses from, what faculty to avoid, how to navigate the institution, how to maintain um, their mental uh, and emotional health. And all of this goes completely, completely without any form of recognition. That came through for us in doing that work from students so very strongly. And I know that we as faculty also do some of that work, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to stress what it is that students do. So the York Collective, for example, who contributed to this text, look at the immense amount of work it takes to bring together such a collective mm -hmm. and to the institution, as Melinda has said, to push the institution to make changes. At UBC, in fact, the only reason why we have that undergraduate minor was because of African awareness, which was a student group that kept agitating for African studies. So in addition to uh, faculty, I just want to add how much emotional labor students, um, graduate students, uh, undergraduate students, perform um, and how unrecognized that is. Thank you, Handel. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Briefly, I, I would say I would I fully agree with this. I would say there is emotional labor. I would also say there's intellectual labor. Um, and there is, and it also takes a physical mm. toll. Mm. I, I, in my comments, I did mention that I think a lot of the heavy lifting has been done by students. Now think about this. Students facing a tyranny of low expectation, facing deficit thinking, facing all these things. And nonetheless, if you actually, actually look at the Stats Canada survey on the Black, on, on Canadian optimism, Black students remain the most optimistic. I think of all students. Why does that? Because they engage in collaboration and, and, and self-help, but they are part of a generations of people who have learned to struggle and uplift on their own. Mm -hmm. What I would say is it is a fraught position for some of us, for example, who are the only one, most of my career, the only black uh, full professor in political science, the only one at many meetings, and now the only black person in senior leadership. So to speak, you are speaking, uh, you are, you're always mindful of your audience. Um, and I would say that is also true for students who are the only one in their classrooms or who are the only one in their graduate programs or the only postdoc, there's only so much you can, you can do. And the way, one way to address that is, to, is for us to highlight at University of Calgary, for example, we have admissions, uh, we have uh, black admissions in law and medicine, student led. We have uh, black African studies being uh, in the faculty of arts being um, energized, student led and student union funded through quality money. So it's not just that they're doing, emo it's not only the emotional labor, it's also the intellectual labor, it's also the fundraising, in addition to thriving with their own studies and their own programs. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that disproportionate labor is an unfair burden that we actually need to name. And the institution needs to take on more responsibility and accountability, including dealing with underrepresentation in the professoriate, as the students called for, and, and hiring more black people in, and, and racialized people and indigenous people in leadership. And this is something I insist on at University of Calgary and will continue to do so, but mm -hmm. we actually need uh, our white colleagues and our peers to take on this responsibility themselves as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, so I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Melinda. Tamari, do you want to comment? I just want to make a, a minor addition to um, to handle on Melinda's point uh, around mentoring. And it is something that I think we don't talk about enough, which is that we not only mentor black students, mm -hmm. we mentor everybody else that comes to us because we are professors for mm -hmm. all students. And my philosophy mm -hmm. is, you know, like Peter Tosh, they asked Peter, uh, how many children do you have? Peter says, they're all my children. And so every student in my class has the benefit of my time and my energy. Mm -hmm. And what I notice of interest is that increasingly, uh, as I become much more confident in articulating myself from vantage point of the black radical tradition, I get more and more white students uh, coming to me for mentorship and they do get it. Uh, but I think this is another issue that we have to have a conversation about that in our pursuit of excellence as instructors, we're getting everybody coming to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that we need to have a conversation about uh, in addition mm -hmm. to supporting black students. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Tamari. Thank you very much for that comment. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. I'm sorry to everybody else who sent in comments and I know we could just keep talking. Um, so, so this one is about the present context of anti-racism anti um, prefaced by the current attacks on critical race theory and critical race theorists. And this, this person would like you to, to say if you think this has impacted your work or may impact your work on the complexities of blackness in, Canadian, in the Canadian Academy. Randall, do you want to go again first? I keep asking you to go first, don't I? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, sure, yeah. Yes, um, uh, critical race theory is the new um, uh, boogeyman, uh, definitely, has been identified by the right. Um, part of what I, I, I would say about this to begin right off the bat is um, I have to say I admire the right for the ways in, the ways in which they can uh, capture a concept and, and demonize it. Um, mm -hmm make that demonization very readily uh, available and, and accessible, much more than the left can articulate uh, those concepts. Of course, the concepts and the, uh, and the discourses are complicated, um, but the right has a, a very interesting way in which they can do things with things like affirmative action, et cetera, et cetera, and, and render them and, you know, into these uh, straw figures and, and pass that on. So that is what is going on right now. Most of the people criticizing critical race theory have never picked up a book or essay about critical race theory. Um, uh, they, they have heard um, <laughs> uh, a caricature of what it is and they're going off that caricature. Um, so, there is an opportunity um, in the attack against critical race theory. Um, I'm thinking, you know, in some of my courses where I talk about multiculturalism and its critical alternatives, I have, of course, a few readings on critical race theory. I'm thinking now this needs to become a much bigger part of that course. So there's, a, there's a, obviously some interest here, and this might be the opportunity to really expand on what critical race theory offers and to have students really explore it. So we are at the university. This is a place where we can exchange ideas and we need to think seriously about the place of critical race theory as something that builds off or as somebody who does 
uh, multiculturalism, critical multiculturalism, the anti-racism uh, critique of multiculturalism. What does critical race theory bring to the table um, that old style anti-racism, which we still need, uh, might not do? Or what does it bring that is new? What are some of its methodologies, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm not too concerned when people talk about critical race theory in the schools, which is mostly a, a US discourse and critique. I'm not too concerned about that um, attack on the specific discourse, because I think people are not talking about the discourse. They're talking about, uh, in a way, what the real problem is, is a problem of white fragility and how we can maintain whiteness um, without exploring um, the problems in society that have to do with race. This is what is occurring in the US and easily might be transferred uh, to Canada. So if it's not critical race theory, it'll be something else. The, uh, the root problem is, are we going to seriously examine race, race relations, racism, colonialism, and the need to address those in our institutions and in our society. The discourses that help us do that are useful and people can begin to try to pick them off, but we shouldn't get put, take our eyes off the ball of the attempt to create a more equitable and just society in Canada. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ando. We've only got one minute, so who wants okay. to say something in one minute? Quickly, I want to say that what we are witnessing is not just critical race theory being called into question. We are seeing the, we, we, we recognize the, the, the importance of language and, and, and power. And so it's critical race theory, efforts to, to, to minimize discussions of slavery, the Holocaust, social, diverse, social justice, diversity is called white genocide. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really important for us actually to, to, to take on this effort, as Handel said, to, to, uh, to turn all of these concepts, theories, and approaches into a straw doll. Further, I actually think it's really important to highlight the, for universities, as we talk about academic freedom, at the same time, we are witnessing book burnings, uh, uh, bannings, and so on. And it's the responsibility of universities and intellectuals to call into questions how this impedes our work, but also impedes uh, the very democracies that enable our work. So it's, it seems to me a lot of this discussion is taken up in, 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 in this book, but it also highlights uh, the, 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 the discussions that needs to happen, not just between left and right, so to speak, but also on the left, the people who are doing this kind of work are rejected and thrown, mm -hmm. and we tend to throw out, to use this perhaps too violent a metaphor, the baby with the bathwater, including around the work of F efforts to advance equity in the academy. I'll stop there, mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Melinda. Tamari, a very brief comment from you, perhaps? Sure. Um, I think all of, all of what Melinda and uh, Handel have articulated is well-placed. I would only add that we need some analysis in addition to this centered on class and racial capitalism. And this is not to exonerate those who are attacking critical race theory, but to understand that what we are going through right now is a fundamental transformation in the white racial contract. The white middle class, the white working classes have been abandoned by their ruling elites. And the racialization comes in through that um, diminution of their access to work, social status, and so on and so forth. So literally through class abandonment, the white working and middle classes are being racialized. And this is why and where they are reacting against critical race theory. So critical race theory is in fact the best explanation, I feel, for uh, the attitude and the derogation of critical race theory from the right. Notice it is coming from those individuals who are very conscious of their ca uh, class destructuration. So I think that we can put forward an analysis which demonstrates the vitality of critical race theory, but also shows that the reaction is in fact best explained by critical race theory. Thanks very much, colleagues. Brianna. 
Um, yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Shirley, Handel, Melinda, and Tamari um, for joining us today. This was such a um, wonderful panel and um, thank you to everyone who contributed um, questions. I know we weren't able to answer all of them. So I think there's a way that we can save these questions and hopefully um, um, answer them offline. Um, so yes, thank you so much to everyone. Here is um, Nuances of Blackness. Um, this book covers so much um, that we were only able to touch on uh, briefly today within this hour. So I encourage everyone to pick up a copy. And uh, just a reminder, we do have a discount code available um, for order on utp.com. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, really appreciate it and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you.